Gordon Moore, the co-founder of Intel, has recently passed away. He was a pioneer in early transistor and IC development, and clear back in 1965, he contributed an article to an issue of Electronics Magazine, stating that the rapidly increasing development of integrated circuits that was occurring in the 1960s would continue. And he projected that density of these transistors would likely double every two years for at least 10 years. Now, what had been viewed as an overly optimistic statement for the era rapidly became reality, and Moore's statement was soon referred to as law. For his predictions did not just hold true for 10 years, but for decades. Alas, in 2005, 40 years later, Moore stated in an interview the following, quote, it can't continue forever. In terms of transistor size, you can see that we're approaching the size of atoms, which is a fundamental barrier, end quote. And indeed, process shrinks are beginning to come to a close. Some may even say, and have said, that Moore's law is already dead, that it's too hard and too expensive to get to smaller processes. And that even if it could be done, the benefits just don't match up with the effort. And of course, for every statement like that, there's another that disagrees. Regardless, all acknowledge one thing. We are working harder than ever to squeeze smaller than ever performance gains out of new chips. And unless a black swan, like an alternative to electrons and silicon, is found via breakthrough discovery, the age of one size fits all processors, it's coming to a close. In its place, we're already seeing the rollout of heterogeneous compute. It's simple, really. The semiconductor is just one half of the equation. The other half has always been software. And for years, we were able to kick the software problem down the road by simply creating denser chips and more streamlined frameworks. But we're near the breaking point. The hardware will need to be defined by the software, not vice versa. Now, on the consumer side of things, there's no better example of moving away from an, uh, a one-size-fits-all chip than Apple's in-house silicon, which, and the irony is not lost on me here, puts everything under the guise of a single chip, the M1 or M2 Pro. But it isn't a single chip. It's a package that houses not just a CPU and a GPU, but specialized hardware blocks for specific software tasks. Video encoding and decoding engines to efficiently handle certain files and formats. An image signal processor to speed up common image editing tasks like noise reduction and white balance. A matrix coprocessor for mathematically demanding workloads like compression, linear algebra, and neural networks. An NPU for machine learning tasks, a secure enclave for encryption, and a unified memory pool to make sure that all of those components can quickly exchange information with one another. These hardware accelerators, in conjunction with frameworks and APIs, enable software developers to bring their own software closer to the metal than they would be able to with general purpose hardware. And this is where the idea of software-defined hardware comes into play, a term originally coined by the United States DARPA. Now, it's only been a couple decades since data centers were filled with just CPUs, but now enter a data center and you'll find CPUs and GPUs, high throughput network interface cards, FPGAs, neural network accelerators, AI accelerators, and more. Even on the consumer side of things, we've had hardware level encoding and decoding for well over a decade, with hardware blocks designed for this purpose built into the packages of off-the-shelf GPUs. A lot of people are not aware of that. It's not just throwing raw GPU general purpose cores. They are designed for video encoding and decoding. So while Apple is not the first, they are in a unique position because they have vertical control of both the hardware and the software. They can assign themselves the burden of complex low-level programming for concurrent execution, and then they can create the frameworks for developers to use and end users to experience. For example, Core ML is provided to devs, and it runs machine learning APIs close to the metal with no work from developers. In fact, devs might not even know where on the package their code is actually being executed because it doesn't really matter. <laughs> and the results can be impressive. As we showed in a Hackintosh build last year, even though our Intel CPU in the HackMac ran laps around our base model M1 chip in synthetic benchmarks, it did lose in real-world video rendering scenarios because Apple's low-level framework, Video Toolbox, permitted our editing applications to access those powerful video engines directly. So this is all great, right? Well, yeah. 
However, we may start to have issues in an important area where we've actually seen rapid improvement this past decade, and that's in compatibility. To illustrate the peak of today's platform agnostic hardware, let's take the Steam Deck. This Linux-based handheld took the world by storm last year, and for good reason. For $400, it packs in an impressive AMD APU with eight RDNA2 compute units, and it does so with a TDP lower than 15 watts. The end result is a handheld game console that can handle modern AAA PC titles with suitable graphical compromises. And more impressively, it does so using Wine to translate Windows APIs to Linux ones, and DXVK or VK3D to translate Microsoft's Direct3D to Vulkan, a cross-platform graphics API. Using a Chromebook, yes, one of those, we can push this idea even further because Chrome OS, which is Linux-based, supports Linux containers, and quite well, by the way. Rather than using macOS Homebrew or Windows WSL, you can present yourself with a containerized Debian terminal in just a couple of clicks. There's no unsigned casks, no performance hits, nada. You can install APT packages and even Flatpak apps via the Chrome OS file browser, say, to install Steam. We have installed the flat pack of Steam and all the dependencies required to launch games using the Proton compatibility layer I just mentioned. And, and check this out. With just a couple of clicks, I can download and install and launch games. Let's take uh, Tomb Raider, for example, which runs shockingly well and is more than playable. This game isn't cutting edge anymore, but don't forget, this is all running on an inexpensive Chromebook, a device without a dedicated GPU and a low power mobile CPU. It's a game for Windows that is using the Proton compatibility layer so that it can run on Linux, which itself is being virtualized onto a laptop running Chrome OS. How could anyone not find that awesome? Unfortunately, it's possible that inter-platform translation may become more difficult as more and more software begins to use libraries and APIs for close to the metal hardware accelerated performance. So let's return to Apple Silicon as the most modern example of this. There have been very big efforts to bring Windows and even native Linux to the Mac. Asahi Linux exists today and it works actually quite well. With a single curl command, you can fetch and run a script that will partition your drive, download and install an Arch-based OS onto your newly created partition with or without a desktop environment, and then upon its installation completion, you shut down your computer and then hold down the power button until the Mac menu allows you to boot into the newly created partition. You'll quickly be greeted with KDE's Plasma desktop environment. And after a quick run through of the setup wizard, you're after the races. You're running ARM-based Linux on your Mac. It's frankly a miracle that anything works at all, but arch carefully because there be demons. A lot of the Mac's hardware works great already on Asahi Linux, but much of it doesn't. And I'm not just talking about display outputs, Thunderbolt, Ethernet, the webcam, microphones, but nearly all of those special coprocessors on the SoC. There's no video engine acceleration. There's no matrix processor. There's no neural engine, nada. Now, while Apple could spend time, energy, and resources getting these features to work on an operating system that they're not really in control of, they're not going to. <laughs> and even if they did, it would be up to the developers of Linux-based packages to utilize Apple's libraries and frameworks to utilize that specialized hardware, which is frankly also unlikely. With that said, the Asahi team has already reverse engineered a bunch of drivers and continues to increase compatibility way faster than anyone has expected. Back in December, just a year after the project started, the team released an open source GPU driver to work with Apple Silicon. And in the past couple of weeks, Lena, one of the Asahi GPU engineers, got a number of 3D games to run on Apple Silicon using Proton. Now, just like Apple on macOS, they need to translate x86 binaries to ARM. However, Rosetta, which is what is used in macOS, being outside of the Asahi team's control from a development standpoint is not ideal. And it's also not licensed to run on bare metal, so that's a problem too. So they turned to FEX, which not only allows for the translation of x86 binaries to ARM, but even permits 32-bit CPU emulation, which Apple's Rosetta can't even do. A lot, and I mean a lot, of older games do not have 64-bit binaries. So for gaming, this is pretty much a must. 
Now, this support isn't built into the public build of Asahi at this time, and there's a lot of work yet to be done. Most importantly, there needs to be a Vulcan driver built from scratch to, well, you know, run any game that isn't super old and using OpenGL. Alas, the future looks promising, and there may come a time in the not too distant future where you can boot your M whatever MacBook into Linux and play any game that the Steam Deck could play. Now, Apple is not the first to move to custom software to find silicon, and it's certainly not going to be the last because it's not just a logical advancement, it's a necessary one. While future fragmentation as a consequence of this silicon may stump cross-platform compatibility for a while, we'll likely find that the performance gains are worth it. And we'll also likely find that despite all odds, reverse engineers find clever ways to make new things happen that previously seemed impossible. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, stay snazzy.